Coming up on DTNS, Uber and Walmart may join forces for grocery delivery. Should car mirrors be replaced by video cameras? Hmm, don't answer so quickly. And earbud wars. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, October 11th, 2019 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Feline, I'm Sarah Lane. Drawing the top tech stories from Cleveland, Ohio, I'm Lynn Peralta. And I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. It has been too long since we've had Annie Gauss on the show, technology reporter at the street. Annie, welcome back. Thanks, guys. Good to be back. It's good to have you. Annie uh, just wrote up a story about all the various people getting into earbuds and putting voice assistants in them, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Uh, we were just now talking about, well, we were just now talking about wings. But before that, we were talking about television shows, uh, which ones we like, which ones we don't. And that is on Good Day Internet. If you want to get that wider conversation, become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. All right, let's talk about a few tech things you should know. A report from IT research firm at Gartner shows that worldwide PC sales rose by 1.1% in the third quarter of 2019, with 68 million units shipped this quarter, compared to 67 million units in the third quarter of 2018. Lenovo shipped the most units with about a quarter of the market share, followed by HP and Dell. Other brands under the 10% market share include Apple, Acer, and Asus. Microsoft announced new ergonomic and slim Bluetooth keyboards that feature dedicated office and emoji keys. The office key replaces the right-hand Windows key. It can be used as part of a shortcut to launch Office apps. So you can probably guess Office W launches Word, for example. The emoji key launches the emoji picker in Windows 10, uh, but it cannot be used to trigger a specific emoji or for emoji shortcuts. So I'm not quite Sure, why they went to so much trouble. But the Microsoft ergonomic <laughs> keyboards cost 60 bucks. The slim Bluetooth keyboard costs 50 bucks, and they're both available starting October 15th. Mixer co-founder Matt Salismendi announced on Twitter that he was leaving the game streaming platform. The news comes a week after Mixer's other co-founder, James Boehm, announced his departure. The platform was originally founded as Beam and acquired by Microsoft in 2016. All right, let's talk a little more about Catalyst. Catalyst is a new framework from Apple that makes it easier for developers to port iPad apps to Mac OS Catalina. Now, it doesn't automatically do it. There's still a little developer work, but the idea that they gave at WWDC is this would smooth the route. There's been some debate over whether it smooths it enough or not, and who might embrace this framework and who won't, Netflix being the most ex famous example of a company that won't. Uh, today, however, Twitter released its new app in the Mac App Store, and since it's based on Catalyst, only users running macOS Catalina can run it. Catalyst doesn't work with the earlier versions of macOS. Twitter seems to have done more work than just use Catalyst. It's not exactly the iPad app. The UI is a little bit different. And the iPad app, you have some buttons down on the bottom. It's all on the left in the Catalyst version of the app. Uh, but otherwise, the, the layout is mostly the same and it works just fine. I, I was using it earlier today. Uh, there, there does seem to be a little nervousness about whether Catalyst was worth all the effort or not, I guess. Yeah, I know on the developer side, um, there was some lamenting of like, well, do people have to like downloads again for Mac OS, like as a developer, of course, you'd never want anyone to do that. But at the same time, if you have to do twice the work or close to it as a developer, you kind of should be paid for your work. So it, it, it sounded like it was a little bit of a mess at least a week ago. Annie, have you been following this at all? I mean, a, l a little bit. I, I mean, I was um, remember when they announced this capability, I guess it was last last year. Um, it sounded like the big pitch was that this is going to cut the, the work of developers in half. But it, by this point, it seems like, you know, at least in the, 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 the case of Netflix, it's not necessarily working out for folks. So I'm curious to see kind of how this develops and what kind of the takeaways are on the benefits and the disadvantages of this uh, approach. Yeah, especially if you can only use it in Catalina, uh, it's 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 going to have a, a more limited appeal. Although the people do tend to update Mac OS uh, fairly regularly, uh, there are also very good reasons, especially after a new release of any operating system, to not update right away. So not as many people are going to be jumping on board this uh, as they would if 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 
Catalyst worked on previous versions. So I think that's going to limit things as well. There, there seems to have been a great appetite for a Twitter app, though. I, I never quite understood that because I use TweetDeck, uh, and maybe that's why. Uh, but a lot of people were just as excited that there's a Twitter app now as they were that it was done in Catalyst. Yeah, I mean, TweetDeck has had its share of update problems as well over <laughs> the years. Sure. Um, I, you know, I'm I'm a TweetBot user, so you know, I was sort of like, ah, third party, whatever. Uh, I I actually don't really know what the Twitter experience is that everyone else is having, but I do think that Catalyst sounds great in theory. I know that uh, smaller developers have come out and said, you know what, this isn't as plug and play as we thought it was. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you know, that that's not necessarily, you know, at the end of the road, you can, you can make an app that works the way that Catalyst is supposed to work. But as a developer, do you want a customer to be, you know, overcharged? Of course not. Do you want to work for free? No. So I think that, 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 you know, that that's something that uh, it's, it's a, uh, it I, uh, developers I, are kind of trying to can't walk that line. Well, yeah, I mean, developers uh, that the idea was a developer for an iPad app uh, would easily be able to make a Mac OS app. And so why wouldn't they? And it'll help bridge that gap. Eh, it doesn't look to me like it's going to bridge that gap. Uber announced plans to acquire a majority stake in the grocery delivery startup Corner Shop. Corner Shop currently operates in Chile, Mexico, Peru, and launched in Toronto most recently. Uber plans to help it expand service to other markets, including in the U.S. Now, Walmart tried to acquire Corner Shop in 2018 for $225 million, but the deal was blocked by Mexican antitrust regulators in June. Walmart works with Corner Shop on grocery deliver delivery service in Toronto currently, and Uber has experimented with its own grocery delivery service before, including working with Walmart. Well, it seems like that makes sense. So uh, Walmart yeah. couldn't buy Corner Shop. Uber said, you know, we need we want to do grocery delivery. Uh, this seems like a great way to do it. And then the two of us can keep working together. Uh, That's right. So yeah, I kind yeah. of expect. Yeah. D does the antitrust situation go away when it's Uber rather than Walmart? I don't know. In Mexico, yeah, anyway. Be because Uber doesn't run a grocery store, right? I think the Mexican uh, objection was that this is Walmart trying to own the supply chain, right? You can't be the grocery store and the delivery agency. That's too much. And and maybe Mexico's concerns go away if it's Uber that's like, no, we're a transportation company and we'll have clients that will deliver lots of things, including groceries. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What I, I'm not, I, I don't necessarily see how this is a positive for Uber's business, though. I, I I, I guess that's the part I'm still trying to figure out is it's, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, there's a lot of players in grocery delivery. They have competitors, including like Amazon and many markets. I don't know too much about the competitive landscape in Chile, Mexico and Peru, but um, the margins aren't that great in this business. And so I'm kind of struggling to figure out kind of what the, what the play is for Uber here um, other than just trying to, you know, spread horizontally into other things that involve delivery and, and cars and, and uh, you know, related markets. Although, you know, Uber, markets. Uber just, mm. you know, recently uh, decided to relaunch its app, um, not available to everybody, but, you know, in, in due time as sort of like ride delivery, but also food. So the fact that they want yeah. their pool of where you can get your food to be bigger than ever does make sense to me. Also, if you can get Walmart as a client to pay you a lot, that that could be enough. That could be enough mm -hmm. for it to make sense if, if you've got yeah. a big client lined up. Uh, so I, if this passes regulatory scrutiny and they do acquire Corner Shop, I wouldn't be too shocked a few months down the road to hear that Uber and Walmart have agreed to a great big partnership in the U.S. to do delivery, leveraging both the Uber platform and the Corner Shop technology. Mm -hmm. Nonprofit yeah. Social Science One is a, an organization founded in 2018 to establish partnerships between academics and data companies. The idea was to have a, a kind of a, an ombudsman to say, okay, academics, we'll hook you up with the data companies. Data companies will assuage your concerns and we'll, we'll broker these deals. So Social Science One has brokered an agreement for Facebook to share 32 million links to use for research. The data set includes the number of times a URL was shared publicly, 
the date it was first shared, the date it was fact-checked, if it was, the country in which it was shared most often, and a summary of the content that the link leads to. It also includes the number of times a link was flagged as false, if it was, and the number of times it was shared without being clicked on. Researchers can look at this data set to study patterns of information and misinformation. This is an important data set. It's huge, and it allows studies to be done to say not just, well, we know that there must be misinformation spreading, but how does it spread? What are the effects of it spreading? Something that I have been hoping people would do more work on. This makes more of that work possible. Differential privacy was used in the data set uh, to make it more difficult to identify individuals from the data, and any scientist that wants to access it has to have a proposal for study. They have to submit it to social science one and have it accepted to receive access to the data once they are approved though they can publish their paper with no restrictions no facebook can't come in and you know say no you don't get to do that uh so there's there's freedom of publishing but there is there is some vetting of who gets access to this data in the first place this is such a great example of i think we've all gotten very trained to be like well you know data collection is very bad uh you know our privacy is at risk uh, this is, you know, no, no big company should do this. This is actually, you know, anthropological studies, you know, are based on this sort of thing. This is the modern world that we live in. And it's, it's kind of nice to hear of, okay, here's data collection that comes from a huge company like Facebook and others, where it actually will help people who care learn more about the human condition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it would have been nice if they came out a little sooner. <laughs> but you know, um, course, yeah. you know the um, you know the uh, 2020 election being in full swing and all. Um, but this is know, this is a bit of a better. Never. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Took the words right out of my mouth. Uh, there were delays in getting this out of Facebook, uh, and at one point, uh, Facebook missed a deadline that Social Science One had set to say, "Well, if you don't get us this data, then you, then we're just going to abandon the project." Uh, but Facebook convinced them that the technical issues were real because they were trying to protect privacy. So uh, in some sense, I'd rather have them do it right, which it does sound like they've done, than rush it and do it wrong, which they have also done in their past. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm with you, Annie. I, it would have been nice to have this earlier for sure. In a notice on Wednesday, the U.S. National Highway Traffic Safety Administration said it is seeking input on whether or not to allow camera monitoring systems to replace rear and side view mirrors. Tesla believes that this could improve the fuel efficiency of its cars by reducing drag caused by side view mirrors. The Alliance of Autom Automobile Manufacturers said that it can improve visibility as well. A five-year study by the NHTSA also found safety risks. Some screens were bright enough to make it harder to see objects on the road ahead at night. Also, raindrops could interfere with camera views. So, yeah, the, I mean, the, the study also found that it, it did improve some things, uh, some visibility over, over mirrors. But uh, I there is a part of me that knee jerk just says like, oh, but I don't know. A mirror definitely shows me what a mirror shows me. Right. And a camera well, can be disrupted. Mm -hmm. it, it could, you know, the, the, the wire could fray and then it doesn't work anymore. But you know what? I also drove a car that didn't have a left side mirror for a while because it got knocked off by somebody and I couldn't <laughs> afford a replacement. So I guess that same thing can happen to a mirror too. I also feel like Listen, I don't really know all that much about drag. I believe that having a rear view mirror on either side of the car will contribute to that. But like, I mean, are we drag racing here? Like, is that really <laughs> like is, yeah. bringing down like the speed or your gas mileage that much? <laughs> yeah, I mean, to me, the the obvious drawback is like wet, like how well, well does this work in weather? Or, or, you know, mm -hmm. I, I know that's been one of the biggest challenges in like developing autonomous vehicles is that, you know, in a lot of LIDAR systems, they just don't work if it's snowing or, or raining, you know, or at least I know that's been an ongoing challenge with um, those types of systems. So it would kind of seem like that would be a factor here too. And that's something that you, you know, no one, none of us can really control. So I, I, I mean, know. I think, I think the 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 raindrops on the lens is the one that really does cause me the most concern because yeah. yes you can have raindrops on your side mirror too but we've we've figured out surfaces that still work even when it's rainy sure. uh you figured out how to shield them and make the surface cause the rain to run off faster and all of that uh 
I assume that there there could be a way to do that with cameras too, but that that is definitely something I would want addressed before this becomes a standard. And that that's why they're doing five year studies and asking for for comments from from people in industry be, before they implement these standards. This also, I mean, I don't know personal uh, you know uh, experience here, but. My my car before the car that I have now was the first car where I had a rear view, you know, put it in reverse and you can see what's behind you. And for a good six months, I was like, this is not helpful. I can't look at that. Like I have to do like, you know, like I have to do what I learned at the DMV when I was 16 years old, you know, like look behind you, you know, look both ways kind of thing. And gradually over time, I have gotten used to it. And mm. I think that, you know, as more and more people are just used to that from the beginning because they know no other kind of car and that's not everybody, but it, it, it gradually will be. I think that that, that, that's sort of an important distinction too. Like how, how, how does this actually replace something that is, has historically for, you know, the rest of us been like the only way that you can see what's around you. Mm -hmm. Apple has ordered a nine-episode follow-up to HBO's Band of Brothers called Masters of the Air. Uh, Tom Hanks, Gary Getzman, and Steven Spielberg still executive producing, even though Apple's going to do it now instead of HBO. Uh, the show will be the first Apple TV show to be produced in-house by Apple's own television studio. Other Apple TV Plus shows are produced by external production companies, and then Apple licenses them and then doesn't get to keep that license, has to keep renewing it if they want to keep that, that content. Uh, so this will be a big deal for Apple to say, no, we own this from the ground up. Yes, we hired these executive producers to come in and, and produce it, but it's our studio that we run in-house. Apple's worldwide video head Zach Van Amberg and Jamie Erlecht will oversee the studio. And Hollywood Reporter says the reason HBO turned down the series was because it was going to cost $250 million to make. And in a world where you can't recoup a lot of DVD sales like you could when Band of Brothers was new, uh, they didn't feel like it would generate enough revenue to do it. Uh, and even though Band of Brothers and The Pacific, which was the second in that series, uh, both did well. So Apple, with their big piles of cash, I guess, is like, yeah, $250 million. Now that we, we lose that, stopping to pick up our wallet. No big deal. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I didn't see that show. Did you guys watch watch that original show I band of brothers uh <laughs> i i i did not i i heard that it was really good <laughs> okay but no but no i did not yeah nor did i but it I'm won a lot of emmys though that's right, right. Well. that's right yes it <laughs> was it was it was largely deemed to be a very good show yes I, well uh, apple has like i mean uh, it seems like apple is like really gunning for the awards too like it's really important to them that they win some awards once this thing launches because that helps lure more hollywood people in and brings credibility to what they're doing and and so on and so forth so maybe that's what their their game is here they don't seem to have a problem getting big names to work for them but yeah uh, that does yeah. seem to be what they're after is we we need to win some awards to show that we are hbo -er than hbo Right. Yes. This, you know, that HBO's whole thing has always been we're the highest quality television. It's not television. It's HBO was their slogan, for instance. Uh, and Brian Brushwood on Cord Killers has been railing about the fact that HBO Max is going to water that down. And I assume that's why Apple is like, well, there's an, a niche for us to move in and take over that slot. Yep. And if they're going to if, I don't know how they expect their television efforts to pay off if they're moving to services and they're only charging $5 a month for the service. Uh, but they certainly are in customer acquisition mode by saying, we're just going to have the biggest names in television making like really attractive looking stuff. Well, we'll 99 cents per, per uh, music uh, <laughs> you know, song at, at one point, you know, but, but had eyes rolling as well. So sure. Sure. I mean, you know? I, if you get enough people in the tent, uh, but do they have enough people in the tent? For them? I guess they did for music. You're right. Yeah, I think this is interesting just in the sense of like, oh, you know, yeah, we know Apple's doing original shows, but like Apple having an original production studio, does that mean a lot for the, you know, end consumer? No, not really. But mm -hmm. but it is a different, it's a difference. It between, will mean something down yeah. the road when Apple can keep this show and not have to worry about licensing it. This the first time Apple loses one of their there own you shows, yeah. you know, down down the road. That yeah, that's that an important, yeah, that's an important point. 
Well, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. So for The Street, Annie Gauss uh, wrote a, an article called The Earbud Wars Are On. Can Microsoft and Amazon Challenge Apple's AirPods? Uh, Annie, tell us about what's going on in the earbud space. Yes. Um, well, uh, you may have noticed over the past few weeks, there have been a couple of new wireless earbuds announced. Um, the first was from Amazon. Um, they're coming out with Echo Buds. These are um, to be released on October 30th. Uh, I think they cost $130 and they put Alexa in your ear. Um, and then shortly after that, Microsoft announced um, a new earbud product called Surface Earbuds. I think they're coming out. Um, I don't know if they announced a launch date, but sometime this year, these are $250. They have a different set of features. And the third they're one is that quite the size of dinner plates, but they are very yeah. large. <laughs> yeah, they're, <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, you know. they're, 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 st they're chargers. Yeah, That's yeah. What they they're, are. They're, they're, they're heftier plates. than, you know, some of the others, <laughs> but, um, you know, to each their own. Um, and then on October 15th, Google is also having a hardware, hardware event. And the rumor is that they are going to be putting out their second iteration of pixel buds. Um, and so the there are some rumors flying around about that. So we're in this interesting moment where, um, you know, the, the, back, the backdrop is that um, Apple has a full 50% of the so-called hearables market um, mm -hmm. with their AirPods. Um, they control, you know, half of the half of the market and the other players, I, I think Samsung has 10%, um, Bose has a little bit of market share and then some other um, Chinese uh, tech companies. Xiaomi. Exactly. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so it, it looks like there's kind of a big challenge coming to, to, to Apple potentially with some of these new earbuds and all of these companies are trying to get on this new wave of putting digital assistance in your, your ear lobes. And I think when the AirPods first came out, uh, people were, were impressed at how well they worked, but a lot of people were skeptical that you would lose them, which you do, uh, and people wouldn't want them because of that, or they, they right. would want wired because it's more reliable than Bluetooth. But it turns out that this market is just exploding. Yeah. And, and you know, it's it just kind of goes to show that this 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 category of, of, of device is evolving t into so much more than just like the thing that you use to listen to music when you're walking around or to podcasts. Um, and so, you know, it kind of with, um, you know, Surface, for example, they have the Surface earbuds will have Cortana. They're doing something a little bit different. They're kind of gearing it more towards enterprise use cases. You know, it's connected to your um, Microsoft 365, you know, suite, so you can use it to check your calendar or whatever you do, um, and also has um, translation capabilities, for example. So that's like kind of a little bit different piece of the market, but um, overall, you know, all of these companies are, it, it's becoming a two-way channel where it's not just for listening to your music, it's for interacting with that digital assistant as well. So, um, so it'll be really interesting to watch like how, how, you know, how all of these devices do, whether any of them can really challenge AirPods and kind of um, complement their own ecosystems with this new, you know, type of device. And ultimately, like, how, how does, how does this category of device like affect how people if it will it affect and and how um, how will it affect how people interact with their digital assistants? Well, somebody who started using the Jabra um, 65T Elites, um, which was something that we did on a a, um, a a former Live With It segment on DTNS, I I had never had wireless headphones before. So I mean that alone was like wow this is great. I mean you know just not having the wires was you know. But there was so much about the sound quality that I was like, I have actually been really missing out on this mm -hmm. um, with like, you know, just kind of like the like, I don't know, headphones that Apple gave me. Sorry, Apple, but, you know, they kind of sucked compared to this. And because of that, I have, you know, I, I've been really enjoying something that I, you know, I think is like. It, you know, it's pretty good audio on the go. And mm -hmm. what's funny is that um, I just started listening to a podcast. It's music oriented. So it's very much, you know, about music and, you know, listening to, you know, beats and the whole thing. And they say at the beginning, try to listen to this podcast with your best headphones. Now, my best headphones are my Sony headphones that I'm wearing right now. But my mm -hmm. second best are my Bluetooth headphones because they are 
pretty good. And I don't remember that ever being, you know, the case before. It was always sort of like, eh, yeah, the, you know, mobile headphones on the go are like never going to be as good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that, the, a lot. You know, I, I think you know I don't have the details right in front of me, but like you know, they they all kind of have premium, um, you know, purportedly have premium audio quality, and then also the the digital assistant built in. I I wonder about the digital assistant thing. That seems to be the gamble that they're all making. That that seems to be the way they want to differentiate. Which again, silos off products. If you're on this ecosystem, you're going to want the Amazon earbuds. If you're on this one, you're going to want the Pixel earbuds. Uh, but I don't use the assistant. In fact, I turn it off yeah. because I just want to tap to pause and unpause or pull out the, the, the earbud to talk to somebody because it automatically pauses when I, I pull it out. That's the part that's magical for me, the automatic connection and, and the ability not to have to think about it. I don't go around talking to my yeah. earbuds. Do people, am I just weird and old or, 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 <laughs> a, you know, do people do that? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm I, I'm not totally sure what the ideal use case is for that. I mean, is it like kind of like call, hey, call Tom or, you know. I, yeah, I do I, that. I, guess I definitely do, do that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. I, when I'm I like mean, out I don't, jogging, I don't want to have to tap and talk <laughs> and tell it like, pause, hold on. And then the person's like, you're talking to me? And yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, what what's really interesting to me about this is like, you know, will some new new use cases kind of emerge with people in, you know, digital assistants in their ear? And even beyond that, like, will the differences between all these assistants, between Google Assistant and Siri and, and so on, like, and Alexa and so on, like, will they become even more pronounced? Like, will, those, will, the, will the distinctions between those assistants even matter, you know, given the way that people wind up using these um within in the earbud context or if they none or if you know tom you're kind of like the the you know the average user and you're like why would i you know talk to siri when i'm out walking around or um yeah i know. mean she comes in she comes in handy every once in a while yeah. <laughs> who he he my series or he i know yeah. my mom has the same thing she's like siri's not a girl yeah, Sarah. my Siri is a British gentleman. That's right. Yes, hers as well. Thanks, everybody who participates in our subreddit. No matter who your digital assistant is, gender-wise, we will accept you. Please submit your stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. We're also on Facebook. Join our group if you haven't already, facebook.com slash group slash dailytechnewsshow. Looks like we have a cool tip in the mailbag today. We do. This one comes from Professor Metcalf, um, who said, wanted to chime in on the D-Link unpatched router issue. We were talking about this the other day, and Tom was fired up. Mm. Um, Professor <laughs> Kevin says, over the last several years, I've gone through half a dozen rubber, uh, routers by several manufacturers for exactly this issue. There are a number of botnets on the internet that leverage vulnerabilities like end of life devices, which are ostensibly the first line of defense in your home network. I finally decided to take an old PC I had laying around and put PFSense on it so I could be sure to get updates for years to come. It's not the easiest thing to set up, but there are plenty of how-tos out there. It might be an option for Scott, because Scott was talking about, you know, if he has an issue, um, if he rage quits D-Link eventually. <laughs> yeah, this is this is a great tip uh, for, for people who like to, to do a little DIY or make good use of, of old equipment. Uh, thank you, Professor Metcalf, uh, for that. And in fact, Roger, your column that came out yesterday on patreon.com slash DTNS dealt with this as well, didn't it? Uh, yeah, so real quick is essentially there are a subset of routers that have been designed to be accessible by the open source community. And even though the company no longer produces or supports that particular hardware, the open source community still releases, if not regular, pretty regular updates to things like DDR DDWRT or OpenWrt that allow you to still maintain and use that hardware. You just don't get all the new you know, GWiz features from all the new hardware. Uh, that you're missing out on. But you know what? I have an eight-year-old router that still works, and my dad has no problems with it. Yeah. And if you're not a tinkerer or if you're dealing with somebody who doesn't want to do those those kind of options, uh, the, the newer routers, the, the mesh routers uh, out there, do a good job of, of updating firmware 
regularly. Uh, we'll see how far they go, but my Eros are, are a few years old now, and they, they continually are updated and, and patched for security and everything. So that that's another element of the, the market that I think is better about this sort of thing than, than say, the old D-Links were. Shout out to our patrons at our master and grand master levels. Uh, we like to thank everybody who supports us. Uh, we have new Patreon levels. And so a uh, big thanks to everybody who is jumping in at those new levels, including, I think I've got some names here, uh, Jeffrey Zilks, Dr. Carmine M. Bailey, and Bjorn Ender. Woo woo. Thank you for that. And thank you, uh, Annie Gauss, for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Uh, if you are, uh, if people want to find out what you've got going on, where should they go? Um, best to go to Twitter. My Twitter handle is Annie Gauss, A-N-N-I-E-G-A-U-S. Excellent. And uh, look for her work at thestreet.com. Yes. Also, thanks to Len Peralta for drawing with us today. Len, we're waiting with bated breath. What do you got? You know, uh, I there's... There's something wrong with my screen sharing options. I don't know if you're seeing right now the background. Of... Yeah, we're seeing the lovely Catalina background. It's gorgeous. <laughs> yes, we are. <laughs> we'll have to figure this out. So <laughs> I'll have to figure this out off. But new oh, bug man. report for Catalina. Break screen sharing for Len. <laughs> yes, I will stop oh. sharing. But what you want to do is you want to go to Twitter right now. Uh, visit Len Peralta. Dot com. It's uh, it's an answer to a, a war I had no idea was coming. It's the Battle of the Buds, and uh, you can see uh, four little buds fighting one another. Uh, <laughs> there's uh, Echo, Air, Pixel Boy, and of course Surface. And uh, you know, I it's unfortunate you're able to see it right now. We'll have to figure that out. That's a technical thing. But uh, you can actually look on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash len, or go to my online store, lenperatostore.com, and check it out right on the front page, right there. It's called Battle of the Buds. Yes, yeah, so if you go to lenperaltastore.com, uh, you, you can all look at it right now, no matter how or where you're looking at it. And uh, I have to say, as always, it looks great. I it's love it. It's pretty cool. It's fun. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's good stuff, man. Thank you so much. LenPeraltaStore.com. Don't miss it. Maybe this is the better way to get people to look. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, think, I think that's right. <laughs> but mm. Surface, Pixel Boy, Echo, Air, the Battle of the Buds <laughs> is off. <laughs> Folks, uh, we have a new Patreon reward system. If you become a member of DTNS, you could get a peek at our show rundown as we develop it. Uh, behind the scenes chats where we just pop into Discord and we're going to be scheduling more of those. And if you back the show before October 31st at the $2 level or more, you'll get a PDF copy of the official DTNS cookbook with recipes from us, some listeners, and more. Sign up right now at patreon.com slash DTNS. We love your feedback. Keep it coming. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is where to send it. We're also live. Join us if you can, Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 2030 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Holiday on Monday in the U.S. We'll be back on Tuesday with Patrick Beja. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>